Hello, welcome to the Sex Ed. I'm your host, Liz Goldwyn, founder of thesexed.com, your number one source for sex, health, and consciousness education. On our website, thesexed.com, you can read original essays written by our network of experts, watch live talks and videos, listen to past episodes of this podcast, and sign up for our weekly newsletter. You can also follow us on Instagram at the Sex Ed. Today, my guest is Jill Soloway, creator, writer, and director of the groundbreaking Amazon series Transparent, I Love Dick, and more. They are also the author of the best-selling memoir, She Wants It, Desire, Power, and Toppling the Patriarchy. Jill and I talk about the importance of being awkward, Hollywood power dynamics, how they navigated their own Me Too moment on set, and of course, toppling the patriarchy. Thank you, Ann Sheldon, for being here. This is so official. This is exactly what I want to be doing, like, talking about the stuff that matters and making sure we're recording it so the whole world can hear. Yeah. So what's so amazing to me about your career, um, you know, author, creator, writer, director, is your all of your projects tend to be very personal and boundary pushing, which is often hard to do in mainstream you know, Hollywood projects. And I'm just curious if you ever played by the rules or you always were like, fuck it, I'm going to write my own. I don't feel like I ever quote unquote played by the rules. I definitely got distracted in my thirties by being part of the status quo. I wasn't trying to play by the rules. I was trying to work. And so I was working on some shows that were like sort of classic regular television um, a sitcom called Nikki that Nikki Cox was in. Um, what else did I do that was, I worked on the Steve Harvey show. Um, so I took jobs. I probably worked for 10 or so years on shows that felt like kind of regular work, but I never felt like, oh, I'm making a concession. I just, you know, I'm, I generally have fun. So it's sort of like I was working in rooms with mostly men making comedy that appealed to a mostly straight crowd. And it just kind of like didn't occur to me. I always had feminist yearnings, but, um, you know, I'm like, I think of myself as a translator. I think of myself as somebody who can exist in a really radical world or exist in a really queer world and then also exist with like suburban moms. And I feel really at home in both places. And I like to be able to be the person who can kind of translate in between. But you always felt that way or was yeah. that something that happened post thirties? No, I always felt that way. It was definitely less about, um, I always thought about gender. So when I was in college, I was thinking about women's studies and feminism um, so I guess I wasn't thinking about gender, I was thinking about feminism. And so, yeah, I was always trying to sort of translate sort of some of the more radical feminist notions. And then I think when sex positive feminism happened, I then found myself trying to translate those notions. And then recently it's been like much more about gender than simply feminism. Right. So like Transparent, which is based on your real life. Mama, yeah. You have this incredible avenue to explore gender and non-gender identity outside of therapy, yeah. literally of your own life and make yeah. it relatable. Yeah. How did you get that opportunity? You know, I was working on Six Feet Under and Grey's Anatomy and United States of Terra and just feeling like, oh, I wish I could direct. I wish I could direct. I wish I could direct. You know, I could only get work as a writer, get work as a showrunner, but I couldn't bust through that like ceiling into directing. And Kind of all around the same time, my parent came out. I made a movie called Afternoon Delight. Um, I was, I like kind of grabbed for that brass ring of director very consciously as my parent was saying, I'm a woman. And I was so amazed and proud of her that at 70, she would say, hey, this is me. That I was like, I can't believe I've been so lazy about saying I'm a director. I was kind of just like going whichever way the wind would take me. Um, but I wasn't like, planting my flag and saying, I am a filmmaker. I am a director. I am an artist. I was kind of like, everything happens for a reason. And so maybe I'm a showrunner, writer who never gets to direct. You know, I'm a, like a go with the flow kind of a person. So my parent coming out as trans made me like plant a flag and say, I'm a director. And then I made Afternoon Delight. And before too long, Afternoon Delight went to Sundance. I won the directing award, came back. And then I was like, okay, I'm ready to tell the story of my family and my parent. The sniffing is my dog, in case anybody can hear it. Probably not, right? People don't care. So, yeah, I um, 
after Afternoon Delight, I realized, okay, it's time for me to tell the story and wrote a pilot and pitched it to all the usual suspects, HBO, Showtime, FX, pass, 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 pass. And then my agent was like, you know, Amazon's making television. I was like, Amazon, shopping website. They're like, yeah, they're making original content. So I was like, okay, I guess. And I went and pitched it there and they said yes. And there it was, you know, this opportunity for me to take this story that was so personal. And yeah, like, just like you said, it is kind of like therapy. You get to cast the people and you pull in actors and you create a family that then kind of lives out the storyline, which has been like the past five years. And was some some of the stuff that was happening with your family and your personal life was unfolding as you're writing. Right. Like kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would be while I was writing, sometimes while I was shooting. I would think something, I would write it, you know, because as writers, we kind of express our unconscious through the fantasy of the page. So I would think something, I would write it, then I would do it because I had become comfortable with it by writing it. Then I would cast it, and then I'd be, like, doing it and casting at the same time. Like, there'd be a real person and a fake fake person. And, yeah, it got kind of clunky so occasionally. You, you found yourself writing things before they would happen a lot of times? Yeah, sometimes before. Sometimes, you know, I was in a relationship, and, you know, Allie was in a relationship. And there was a, you know, similar version. You know, I was in a relationship in real life with Eileen Miles. Allie was in a relationship with Cherry Jones, who was kind of based in Eileen Miles. We created the character of Leslie before I met Eileen. So yeah, when you're writing, you're kind of like, what would it be like to go out with somebody like this? I'm just going to write it, not do it. And then you're like, oh gosh, well, it's also happening, you know? So yeah, and then there were times where like, I think Eileen and I had just broken up, but she was coming to visit the set and we were filming a scene that I'd written like months before about us breaking up. And so we were watching these characters break up and it was, it was awkward. I kind of like forgot that that's the scene we were shooting that day that she came. And then you were also, you're a mom, you have two sons, and you were beginning to explore your identity as well, yeah. more publicly as yes. being non-binary. Yeah. While right. also being the, you know, a leader in terms of speaking about these issues in mainstream media, that must have been quite a learning curve, especially yeah. with pronouns even. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, it happened so slowly for me that, it didn't feel like that big kind of like coming out of the closet thing. You know, people would be like, how did you come out to your sons? You know, and it doesn't really work that way. You know, when you're in a family, you know, I think people who were close to me slowly watched certain things happen in my life, you know, and it went in like a much more subtle order. You know, I think for me, it was like I got breast reduction surgery, started dressing differently, started wearing less makeup, cut my hair, started dating women. Like these things happened slowly, not all the same day. And at the end of the journey, having the non-binary identity was less like a transition for me and more like an arrival at a place where um, I could kind of be free of gender. Mm -hmm. And so when people are like, I don't know your pronouns, like I don't get it. It's like, it feels like people are making it much more complex than it is for me. And for me, it's sort of about never having to fulfill any particular expectations around a gender. Like, this is what a mom is like, but this is what a dad is like. This is womanly. This is manly. Like, I'm opting out of all that stuff. So for me, it feels like, okay, I'm free, finally. And if people can catch up with the right pronouns, great. If they can't, also also fine. I mean, we're lucky living in California as well, just in terms of the legality of changing your gender identity, which I know you recently yeah, just did, did it, right? Yeah. And I just also saw that United Airlines will let you travel with an X instead of an M or an F, which is huge because what's happening for um, trans people who travel is that there's this very weird system that um, a TSA person will gender you before you go through the x-ray. So they, they gender you as you come through the line and they decide that looks like a woman. I'm going to check F. And then if you go through and the x-ray shows that you have a penis, you get pulled aside. And that's like, of course, incredibly traumatizing for trans people. So the simple idea that if you want to travel with an X marker instead of an M or, F, M or an F, it's like, it's amazing actually. It's kind of interesting how we're in this time period where we're given more cultural permission to be fluid, particularly in places like California or New York, as opposed to maybe the rest of, of middle America or other countries. But there's still this great pressure and invisible set of standards for the gender construct we're expected to meet. For example, you know, if you say, I'm 
I'm non-binary, but sometimes you're mom, sometimes you're they. Maybe your sons call you a different pronoun. Mm -hmm. And there's this, you still have to fit within this box, Mm -hmm. right? Even within this box of of non-binary. Yeah. I don't really feel that too much. I actually feel like because it's such an awkward thing, being non-binary, people don't use the right pronouns and all that stuff. I actually feel like the point is the awkwardness. And it's kind of like the unboxing. So when people are sort of like, uh, I don't know, I, your gender isn't legible to me. I don't know what to say. It's sort of like, oh, thank God. Like they're saying the thing that I always felt for many years, which is people look at me and they think I'm a woman, but I don't feel like one. So now it's just kind of like all on the table, which is, oh, I'm neither. You know, I'm both. I'm either. It's always changing. Forget it. That, I guess that's what I mean, that you, it can, it's always, it is always changing. Yeah, but right? it feels like a non-box. It doesn't feel like a box. But it's a box that other people want to put you in, maybe more than you put yourself in. Where maybe. Where if you say one day, well, I was, a, I was a wife to a man, I'm a mom to sons, this is how I feel at the moment. But it, it almost like, I feel that sometimes people don't get permission to evolve with their sexuality or their gender mm-hmm. as, as we go through life. You know, people want to say, claim, I'm a, I'm a woman. This is, yeah. this is how I identify. This is always how I identify. And also, I think there's a very big difference between gender identity and sexual identity, too. Oh, of course. Too, yeah, they're two different things. Which we get, which we lump together. Yeah, some people do lump that together with me. But I, I, I find that, like, it was maybe more like three or four years ago that people were getting confused about the difference. And also three or four years ago where people didn't get it. I feel like right now people get it. And they're really happy to learn more if they don't get it. At least the people I encounter. Yeah. What about, do you feel like there's an expectation for you to have it all figured out being the showrunner and creator and director of a show like Transparent, where you're just, you're supposed to have it all figured yeah. out at Gecko? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's like the awkward and uncomfortable one. Another uncomfortable part is um, the sort of um, trans community, social media, um, call out culture, you know, I'm sure that a lot of people think like, why is Jill a spokesperson for this movement? Um, Because when I started working on the show, I was only the child of a trans person. I didn't identify as non-binary. And so I think a lot of trans people, rightfully so, get really tired of cis people speaking for trans people. And so, yeah, it's a good question. I was cis when I started making the show. I don't identify as cis anymore. So, you know, is it my place to speak? You know, some people think it is, some people think it isn't. What do you think? I mean, I have no choice. I have to, you know. This is I'm an I'm an artist and this is all, this has always been what I do is make art and part of making art is distributing it and part of distributing it is doing publicity. So, that's that's just part that comes with it. And it's also really hard to get things made within the existing power structure of Hollywood and media. It's not it's not necessarily an easy process and I think shows like yours um you know, you had you had a career. Yeah. You, you know, you knew people in right. the system. It's, it's it's not as easy to get like that kind of Amazon streaming deal coming in the door as someone who already. I mean, we as you said, you're in the room in Hollywood for most of your, your career, right? With all men, right? Who are saying things like, "It's the year of the woman." Yeah. Are we need more female projects? Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's like a, that's quite a weight to carry. Yeah. I would imagine. I think you've, from what I've, I've read, you, you handled it in a very vulnerable and honest way, which is a great strength. Yeah. To tap into that. Again, going to social media culture where everything is played out in these comments. Yeah. Well, I got off Twitter. That helped a lot. Lindy West, I, I was talking to Lindy West and she's like, just get off Twitter. Like there's no reason to be on Twitter unless you like the feeling of, like, rubbing dog shit on your face. You know, it's like there's no good reason to be on Twitter. You can do all the same stuff on Instagram or Facebook. And if you're on Twitter, you just – people who are on Twitter like to get in, like, little spats with people. I don't like to get in little spats with people. It doesn't make, doesn't make me feel good, you know, to get in spats all day. Yes. So I, I, that, just leaving Twitter helped me really relax around that feeling of people are coming after me. Yeah, and I think that there's this whole new wave of social media activism, which happens entirely online, Mm -hmm. but not offline. I mean, Mm -hmm. there are great activists who are online and very vocal, but they're also offline in their communities and Mm -hmm. doing the real work. But then there's this other sense that, you know, these issues require longer conversation Mm -hmm. and in-depth thinking and reading and researching, and it can't all be reduced to 
yeah. a sound bite. Yeah. Well, I corner. feel like I, I get to really say what I want to say in my shows, like in the characters. Say the things in the movies and the TV shows. I get to write a book. Like, I don't feel like I also need to say things on Twitter. I'm happy to just have them be in my books and my TV shows and movies. What was the process of writing your memoir like? It was almost like a kind of like off-gassing or like sloughing off of all of the stress that was happening in my life. And I really didn't think I have to write a memoir. I thought um, there are some things that don't fit in the mouths of characters. And my life is so crazy. Sometimes all I can do is write as a way to find my way through. And and when I decided to write the memoir, it was when my marriage was ending and I was really trying to make get a sense of, like, what is this feeling I've always been feeling my whole life of kind of not being in the right place and feeling kind of on the outside? Is it gender? Is it sexuality? Is it my parent? Is it this kind of house of mirrors where I grew up not really understanding that my dad was a woman? And so for me, writing the book was less like, I'm going to write a book and get out there with my platform and more like writing a book is going to force me to kind of like go spelunking through my life with a flashlight to try to give some cohesiveness to this story so that I can understand what happened. And how was that How was that reaction when it came out? It was great. Yeah, I had an amazing experience. I feel so lucky, you know. I was able to, I mean, I, I feel like the luckiest person in the world right now as an artist to be able to write the things that interest me, to be able to make the shows that interest me and to have distribution. It's the kind of thing that I just have always dreamed about, you know, that you want to do things and say things and you want it to matter and you want people to care. And I just, I can't believe that I, I have this privilege of being able to have ideas and share them with the public. So is it bittersweet, that Transparent's ending? No, well, we made a musical. So it's the Transparent movie. I'm calling it the Musicale Finale. It has all of my sister's music in it. So there's 10 songs, dances, like amazing musical. And we're hoping for it to become a Broadway musical. So oh. as we say, Transparent's not ending, it's transitioning Yeah, from a TV show into a musical. So. And it's all the original cast without Jeffrey Tambor? Yeah. What was that going through that situation like publicly with him? And at the same time, I know you're super involved with the Time's Up movement as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're still going through it and it is like really sensitive and mostly pretty private. We were a family at, you know, Transparent and obviously super connected with the trans women who, you know, um, were part of the story. So yeah, it's, it was, it was really painful. You know, it was basically just like a family, you know, if you had a family and somebody in your family, you know, um, was going through this, you know, people in your family were going through this reckoning and because it was happening for the whole world at the same time, we were just kind of like, hold on, you know, this is this, this tsunami is coming for everyone, you know. Um, when I yell something like topple the patriarchy on stage during like, I think I like during the Emmys, maybe I said it. And um, you say it, you know, not even imagining that it could actually happen, that, that the world would start to change. In fact, I was talking to um, a friend of mine yesterday about like, just I think it was less than two years ago when maybe a year and a half ago when this stuff happened with Harvey Weinstein and, and just the world as we knew it really just shifted. It, there was a moral shift. What was, access, what was acceptable was no longer, longer acceptable. And so each and every one of these people in places where certain men in power had to say, you know, what of my personality is not consented to by the people around? You know, the thing that when people would come up to me, they'd be like, well, did he do it? It's like every single man of power has benefited from having patriarchy at their back, like the wind at the back of a sailboat, where they can say and do things to women and younger women and newer women and less powerful women that make people uncomfortable, that nobody says anything about because power, because patriarchy, because access to job, to money. Like people are like, it's, it's not about sex, it's about power. And I used to kind of agree with that, but it's like, now I really get it, which is white supremacy and patriarchy run the world. Mostly white men have been in power. So if you're white or if you're a man, a lot of the things that people say to you and do with you are under the pressure of continuing to have access to power. So when white people behave a certain way around people of color, and in particular people of color who might be new to their work, let's say a PA or a background artist, there's no way that person of color could say, hey, that makes me uncomfortable. Don't say that around me. And when men act the way men have been trained to act around women, 
let's say background artists, let's say actresses, let's say somebody who's at any less of a power level than them, which is everybody. If you're Jeffrey Tambor and you're number one on the call sheet, that means everybody has less power than him. You can't actually treat all of the women in the world like, you know, you're allowed to openly delight in them and take them in and take them, take on, you know, a lot of men of a certain generation walk around acting like the world is kind of a buffet for them. So they can be as angry as they want. They can, you know, be as, they can, you know, delight in the bodies of the women around them. They can, you know, make sexual jokes. It's not the same as two people at the same level making a joke. If you're a white person, if you're a man, if you're a white man of power, nobody around you can say, hey, don't do that without losing their job. And white men are starting to realize, they're going like, well, wait a minute, like everything was a lie. Like all the ways in which women acted around me were a lie. lie." And it's like, yes, yes, they were. You know, like there are so many ways in which women make these kind of tiny but constant um, concessions around men to center them and to allow men to center their egos and to center their conversations. I mean, even thinking about that dinner that you threw, you know, for you to have, have created a dinner where there's so many queer people around, like, I'm sure you have memories of other dinner t- dinner parties you've been at where they're surrounded by men and you're off to one side and, you're, and the men are holding court, talking to other men about things that men care about. Like, that was our lives. I mean, that was, that was my childhood. Yeah, <laughs> that's our lives. So we have to work to not center heterosexual men. We have to work. And it's and especially within Hollywood, it's you know from my grandfather's time in Hollywood. I, mean, I can't imagine this was acceptable. The casting couch, yeah. the you know the offices where there's the back door for someone to go out. And I my my first documentary, which is about burlesque yes. called Pretty Things, I was lucky and privileged enough to be able to have a cutting room at Paramount Mm -hmm. under this guy, Paul Hagar, who was the head of post-production. And I think one of the, he was very close with Elaine May. And that was one of the only female directors that he had worked with. And I like this guy. I like this guy. But um, it was the first time, I think, because my dad made more independent cinema and Mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, queer stories, marginalized stories. I hadn't really been in, like, that kind of Hollywood before. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen behavior that I'd only seen in movies like The Player or, or Shortcuts. I hadn't seen people actually like throwing a beta deck out the window yeah. or throwing coffee at their assistant and saying, this is too cold. It was unbelievable. And I was the, this is in like, a, I don't know, it must have been 2002, 2003. And I think there was no other female directors on the lot at that time. Penelope Spheris had been there. And the way that the men spoke about women who are, you know, independent, confident directors or writers, producer was either a bitch or a dyke. Mm -hmm. And then I show up and I've got this cutting room with like pictures of naked women Mm -hmm. all over and I wear red lipstick. And it was like, I didn't fit into those boxes. It was a very strange thing for me. And it was a, it was a real realization of like, oh, I'll never really I'll I'll never be at the same level as these guys, mm-hmm. no matter what I do. And do you still feel that way? I think I said, fuck it. You know, I don't care anymore. And I think a lot of it was just ingrained in me in terms of, you know, growing up with successful men in my family and wanting to, you know, be seen as equal to them. And then really looking at, well, why, Liz? What, you know, why? is that? That's not really what your work's about. That's not really the things you care about. You care about academia and, you know, you care about, research and you care about gender studies and women's studies programs. So what is it that you want from this? Like, you know, a lot of times I find the rules of Hollywood very um, hypocritical. And I think they are, a lot of things are changing now. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear from your perspective where you're sitting at with Time's Up. But also I feel like a lot of like things are, some things are changing more on the surface because now there's a consequence Mm -hmm. to that reaction. If you get found out. Right. But how many other little small ways, you know, is this like a Band-Aid, do you think, from the industry? Or do you really feel like there's a lot of soul searching going on? I think there's a lot of soul searching going on. I think everybody is asking the question. or I think many people are starting to ask some of the right questions. I'm in such a sort of bubble where I'm surrounded by women, queer people, trans people, non-binary people, feminists, people of color. 
surrounded by people, you know, just like we all are in our own bubbles. So I, I look at the world as like, wow, it's totally transformed. Then I'll like leave my set and go to somebody else's set and realize, oh, wow, it's the status quo. Um, or walk around a place like Paramount and see, yeah, it's mostly men doing mostly stuff with mostly men. Um, but I, I see things really changing and I just think things change a lot more slowly than we realize. You know, they change quickly in a moment. Something that happens like Trump gets elected and Harvey Weinstein gets like, I think there's something about Trump getting elected that caused all of the women to go like, oh, hell no. All right, we can't take this guy down. We're trying. In the meantime, none of us are going to stand for this kind of like boorish, narcissistic, awful man in our lives. And the, and, and, and the, and the morality change, you know, there's a book um, by a writer named Kwa- Kwame Anthony Apia, and he talks about uh, things like when foot binding was just like no longer okay. Like foot binding is okay, then it's not okay. And um, many, many things are no longer okay in Hollywood and hopefully in other workplaces. But a lot of it is there's lawsuits that mm-hmm. come up and then someone finds out about the lawsuit now, which would have happened and been paid under the right. table for years. Right. And now all of a sudden you have these captains of industry and these corporations losing millions of dollars. Yeah. So they're forced into a position where they have to have um, things like, you know, consent programs right. in-house. And, you know, in Hollywood now, I think you have intimacy coaches. Is that right? Maybe oh, on in, set. On set? Yeah, sure. Why not? Do you have that on your show? No, shots? I mean, you know, we haven't we haven't done any sex scenes since, you know, the reckoning. So, so there's a real for you. It's like before and after the shift. Yeah, I mean, I think we were thinking a lot about things like consent and comfort, and I was really taking on that work. It's emotional labor, you know, also known as unpaid emotional labor. If you're doing it in your household, you know, you're, you're doing a thing that a lot of women do, which is, um, or female people or feminine people or femme identified people do, which is kind of just like fluff up reality to make sure everybody's okay all the time. And I was kind of doing that anyway on the set, like trying to kind of constantly check in to make people were okay and talking about safe spaces. Of course, like things still happened because of Jeffrey's position, you know, he, has, you know, talked about the fact that he had a bad temper and would kind of lose it on people. So it started this kind of, um, you know, feeling of like, yes, we all have like really warm feelings of art and safety, but at the same time, you know, power in Hollywood belongs to the most important man and the most important man has a temper issue. And so we all vibrate around making sure he doesn't, you know, lose his temper. So that, that just became normalized. Now I would look at that and say, we have to stop it right now. You know, I would talk to him afterwards and say, like, you can't treat that person that way. And he would say, I'm so sorry, you know. But now people recognize that that kind of thing is a is a real risk to an entire project, you know, financially and morally and everything, you know. But the, the thing that's so interesting to me about consent and I think so cumbersome about consent is um, – you know, as I was doing research into my book, which is called She Wants It, and it's really about consent in many ways. Um, somebody, I read somewhere that somebody said, like, people treat consent as if it happens in a snapshot. It doesn't. So you might meet a man, and you might go to a bar with him, and you might think he's fantastic, and then you guys are walking to your car, and he says in a very beautiful way, can I kiss you? And you say, yes, you may, and you start making out. And the next thing you know, he sticks his hand down your pants. He didn't stop and say, can I stick his, your hand, my hand down your pants? And you did consent to the kiss. But the truth is he would have needed to just like recheck in about the next thing. And he didn't. So what does this mean? It means that actually consent is an ongoing conversation and it's actually a spiritual conversation. It means I'm paying attention to you all the time. And I'm hoping that the best things happen to you. So that every time I touch you or do something different than what you actually said yes to, it's still working for you. And hopefully any two sexual partners are doing that the entire time they're having sex. Even if they've decided they want to play with power and I want you to be the top and I'm going to, you know, let's have a safe word. I'm going to say no. I'm not going to mean it. 